Hello, this is Dr. Ned Hallowell, and welcome to Distraction. Today, I'm, I'm very happy to welcome Katie Acevedo. Did I pronounce that right, Katie? Azevedo, you are pretty close. Azevedo, well, I'm I'm, I'm getting getting better. (laughs) Uh, She is the founder and creator of SchoolHabits.com, as well as YouTube.com slash SchoolHabits, and uh, also the Pomodoro Technique, which is not a way of making pasta. But a but a way of uh, helping kids do better better in school. Um, she's a, a self described uh, uh, school junkie and uh, uh, someone who loves school. But uh, she's also aware that some people don't love school so much, and uh, she's taken her ability to sort of master school and uh, gone on to help other people. Uh, who who don't do school so well learn how to do school much better. It's a, a terrific uh, service she provides, and and she's here to uh, share with us what what she's learned. So let's just jump right in, Katie. And can you tell our listeners a, a little bit about yourself and what you do? Sure. Yes. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, so as you said, yes, I am a self-described school junkie. Um, I have been teaching for a little bit over 12 years, um, and I actually started teaching, I guess I would call it the elite of the elite, the students who were taking the college entrance exams, so the SATs and the ACTs and then even the GREs, um, looking for your tip-top scores. Um, And I was vice president of a premier tutoring company for um, close to a little over 10 years. And that's where I spent a lot of time developing curriculum, um, implementing curriculum, and just teaching the content of the test. And then it kind of struck me slowly. So I don't know if it, yeah, it sort of was this incubation, um, this thought and incubation that I had that, wow, the students with the greatest improvement in their scores were the ones who knew how to study. Um, It wasn't that the students who had stagnant scores weren't studying. It wasn't that they were lazy. It wasn't that they weren't trying. It was that I just kind of realized that the students who had the greatest improvement were the ones who knew how to get the information that I was teaching them into their brains and for it to stick and for them to know how to access that information when the time came, which was, you know, during the test. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I just kind of realized that the how of learning was a missing piece. Yeah. Um, and so I said, you know what, I'm, <laughs> I'm going off, I'm doing my own thing and I'm, I'm teaching, I'm going to focus on the students who don't have that piece about how to actually learn, how to study. Um, so is that why you created School Habits? That's why I created School Habits, yes. Um, for the general student who wants to get better at what they did, but then also, um, so I have a background in special education too. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I went back to work on my master's in special ed mm-hmm. so I could focus on students with um, learning disorders, ADHD, ADD, autism spectrum disorder, um, a lot of types of learning disabilities that impede somebody from accessing their curriculum. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, that's where I am today. And I just, I make videos and I, I teach. So what, <laughs> what is School Habits? Sure. Well, School Habits, so it's, it's a website and it's video tutorials. Um, I also do one-on-one instruction um, with clients in the area where I am. Um, mostly students with autism spectrum disorder, with ADHD um, as well. Um, I still do the SAT for sure, college essays, that type of thing. But I teach school habits that the name came from, this concept that school was more than the material that a student was expected to learn. It was more than the curriculum. Um, it was school should be, and it sadly wasn't, I realize, a place where students learn to, they learn the tools for learning. Um, and so they, that's not something that's typically taught in schools. And I just sort of realized that over, you know, I've worked with over 3,000 students one-on-one, and I would say a small portion of them had these types of tools. They knew how to study, how to manage their time, but most people didn't. Um, so I said, hey, these are good habits for school, hence school habits. So my mission is to teach the fundamentals so that kids can go flying from there. What are some of the habits? Sure. 
Um, well, some of the habits, um, I guess you'd sort of loop them into the executive functions. Um, so prioritizing, task initiation, organization, time management, the whole piece around metacognition, which is, of course, um, thinking about thinking. Um, it can be broken down more specifically in terms of school-related things like note-taking, um, different techniques for studying based on learning styles, mm-hmm. um, that type of thing. The, the things that the, the skills that students need as they're sitting in class, listening, and the skills that students need when they're home and they have material in front of them, but they don't know what to do with it. Well, one of them is this Pomodoro technique. Is that correct? Absolutely. The Pomodoro technique. <laughs> Huge is, fans. What is that? <laughs> sure. So that was actually, um, it's been around for a while. It was invented by Francesco Cirillo. I kind of pronounce his name differently every time, um, back in the 1980s. And it's a tech time management technique that students, um, that I've been teaching students for the longest time. I've been using it myself, not really knowing that it was something that it could actually help students with something like ADHD. I thought it was just, you know, a productivity tool, a way to get more done in less time. Um, but then I slowly realized that the te- Pomodoro technique is something that really helps everybody, especially students with executive dysfunction, so maybe those who lack time management skills. And it's basically, it's kind of fun, um, but there's the school dork in me thinking <laughs> that this type of thing is fun. It is this concept of working for 25 minutes, and then taking a break for five minutes, and then rinse and repeat. And this idea, so the 25-5 ratio, that's the traditional Pomodoro technique. And what happens is it forces students or people or whoever's using it to work in a concentrated flow state for 25 minutes, after which point, a timer beep. So that is the absolute key is that you have to set a timer for 25 minutes and you work nonstop until that timer beeps. And then when that timer beeps, you set the clock again for another five minutes and that is your break. You can do what you want for those five minutes. Um, I always recommend to my students, you get up and out. So you get up out of your chair and you get out of the room. Mm -hmm. When the timer beeps again, you go back to your work and you kind of, you rinse and repeat this process until the task is done. Um, usually maybe about four sessions. So four Pomodoros. So 25, five, 25, five, 25, five, 25, five, so 25, two, five. two hours. Yeah. And then you take a longer break. What's a Pomodoro? A Pomodoro. So yes, odd, odd question. Um, it is a tomato in Italian. So this um, software developer, Francesco Cirillo um, was Italian, and he just happened to have one of those old-school, traditional um, kitchen timers in the shape of a tomato. You can still actually get them today. Um, and so he used the timer shaped in a tomato for his Pomodoro techniques that he was using as he was creating the uh, system and then just decided to name it that. So it has no psychological significance really other than he had a tomato in front of him and it, it worked. But you should, you should get a timer. It doesn't have to be a tomato timer, but it should be a timer that rings. Absolutely. It should be a timer with sound. Today's iPhones, I mean, yeah. or phones, whatever, they have timers. There's actually a Pomodoro, um, I believe there's a Pomodoro app uh-huh. that is specifically like a 25-5 uh-huh. and you can sort of adjust your um, work and rest intervals uh-huh. depending on the task at hand. Um, but the 25-5 is, is the classic and it does work for mm-hmm. most students. Mm-hmm. And the five minutes is, is enough of a break? For most people. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. Yeah. So what, what happened is any longer than that, if you're working for 25 minutes, a five minute break proportionally should be enough to sort of reset your concentration, to mm-hmm. kind of replenish your glucose a little bit, because that's what we use when we're thinking, right, for those 25 minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, any longer than five minutes, somebody, especially with a tendency to become distracted, perhaps someone um, with ADHD They'll or something like that. They get off like into that. something else. Right, yeah, then they get yeah. too wrapped into something else. Right. That's exactly it. And right. then they find it really hard to get back. Right. Right. Um, and then the other thing, too, is keeping the break short is really important. Um, because a lot of times 
students or adults with ADHD have poor um, working memory or short-term memory. And so if you wait too long between your working sessions, then a lot of the material that you are working with is now out of your short-term memory and you no longer have access to it. And so you spend a little bit too much time of your next 25-minute session trying to kind of backtrack and say, where was I? What was I doing? Right. And then you're not, you're not really ever moving forward there. Right. It sounds great for people with ADHD. It, it can use for studying, certainly. What else? What about cleaning house or doing other tasks? Yeah, certainly. No, it's, um, I mean, I use it for, <laughs> I use it for cleaning, but I will gamify anything. Yeah. Um, it's anything that somebody might find unpleasant. So that would be different for most people. So paying, um, for paying everybody. bills or... or right, uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, cleaning out your sporting good closet. Who wants to do that, yeah. you know, for two hours straight? But, yeah. you know, if you break it up, um, it could be done for, for even for reading. Um, so not necessarily studying, but yeah. if you have a big... Um, if you want to get through a book yeah. and you're just finding that you're zoning out, yeah. you know, that fake reading syndrome, as I, I like to call yeah, it, where you yeah. read the whole page yeah, yeah. and you get to the end and you're like, I don't know what I just read. Yeah. If you read for 25 Put the book down. Give yourself a five-minute break. Get back into it. I mean, it, it has a lot of applications. Um, people who are in the workplace and they have projects yeah. um, to get done. I mean, you're not really thinking student at that point, but a work project has the same sort of consequence as a, you know, not getting your homework done type thing. So. Yeah, that's wonderful. Can you check your social media during either of the intervals? So definitely not during the work uh-huh, interval, because uh-huh. during the work interval, you should be only working. Um, in fact, before you set up the work interval, um, I recommend that you have all your materials in front of you. So that should take this some prep work that needs to take place before you sit down to do a Pomodoro session. Um, and then I tend to be a little bit flexible with what happens during the um, rest session. And it does, it really depends on my students. Um, if I have a student with, you know, who may, um, be on the spectrum and has really, really difficult time once they get into their social media, it's, it's really hard to bring them back out, then I usually keep the social media off, off limits. Um, but some students really need that or, or they benefit from that quick hit of dopamine that, Sadly, our addiction to our cell phones gives us, yeah. um, and then they're able to feel, okay, connected again, although it's a fake connection, you know, right. social media, what type of connection is that? Um, but then they're able to come back feeling like they're not missing out, that right. fear of missing out. And sometimes it works for students. You kind of have to monitor yourself or be monitored to know that if a social media break is good or not. Right, right. One of our producers told me she used to take uh, drink coffee in college and stay up all night studying. Why, why is this not an effective way to study? Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> We've been there, done that. It's um, My drug of choice was coffee. But yeah, yeah. yeah it's um, so big, long study sessions, uh, which is the classic. You know, I, yeah. I hear students like almost brag about it sometimes. Right. You know, I was up all night. And what happens is there is very little time on task, as you would say, right. when someone is, you know, doing this big, long cramming study session. You may be in disguised as studying for, you know, six hours straight overnight, but right. the amount of time that your brain is actually focused on what you're doing right. is very, very little um, in comparison to the amount of time that you look like you're studying. Um, and I, I oftentimes explain to my students that there's this research has sort of, um, proven, I guess, I'm, I'm always tentative to use that word, but this primacy recency effect, I'm not sure um, if you've heard it, it has another name of the serial effect. Um, and it's this concept of we recall information that comes first and comes last. Right. And so if somebody were given, um, if you threw a party, for example, if I threw a party, um, I might remember the first five people who came you know, walk through my door when the party started, and I may recall the names of the five people who left. They were the last ones. They helped me clean up. Um, But the order of the people who came to my party in the middle would all be scrambled. So we tend to remember what information comes first, the primacy, and the information that comes last, the recency. And so what happens when you, and the stuff in the middle is all just, you know, Lord knows where that goes. So if you think of that, a big, long study session, you have a giant middle you have a giant black hole. 
But if you're doing short, frequent, short, frequent study sessions, something like the Pomodoro technique, right? You're giving right. yourself more beginnings and more ends. That's the concept where the 25-minute work interval really, really makes sense. Because if you have four 25-minute work intervals back-to-back, that's four beginnings and four ends, more opportunity for your brain to remember what you're actually working on. Um, so that's why no dose and coffee all night will not work. Right. Um, it's just, it's not smart. You're going to wear yourself out, and we do need breaks, just like we need breaks when we're um, doing anything, right? Sure. Are there some other habits we should work on breaking? Oh, in the, in the context of being a human or in the context of being a student? <laughs> in the context of being a student. <laughs> sure, yeah. I mean, and they're tough ones. I mean, that's why they're hard habits to break. Um, I would say a huge one would be negative self-talk. I hear that all the time. Uh-huh. I hear students, you know, saying like, well, why would I try this? Like, I haven't done this in the past. I haven't done this before. I'm unable to do this. Um, and that negative self-talk is one of, that's a disability, that's disabling. Um, even if a student does not have a learning disability, right. the negativity can bring them down. And I think that perhaps reframing that, okay, well, what I've done in the past hasn't worked, and that's why I wasn't able to achieve what I want to achieve. So I'm going to do something new. I'm going to try a new study technique. I'm going to try a new um, time management tool like the Pomodoro technique. I'm going to try a new note-taking method, right? So sort of mm-hmm. reframe failures into, well, I didn't do it before, so now I need to try something new. Mm-hmm. Um, procrastination, that's another one, but <laughs> who doesn't do that? It feels so good in the moment. Right. Um, but that is one that actually the Pomodoro technique can help students avoid procrastination too because sometimes we – especially someone with ADHD, it runs hand-in-hand sometimes with perfectionism. Um, I'm type A. I'm perfectionist. um, I don't have ADHD, but if you were to draw a Venn diagram between someone with ADHD and someone with extreme perfectionism, there is an overlap in the middle and this idea of like, well, I don't want to get started because it's not going to be perfect and I don't know how, but what if you just did 25 minutes? Right. Right? What if you just did 25 minutes of that looming task that was so overwhelming, and then you do 25 minutes of it, and you realize, well, that wasn't so bad. I'm going to take a five-minute break, and then I'm going to do another 25. And then before you know it, that momentum is enough to keep someone going. Yeah, you've got so many wonderful tips. I think you're, it's obvious, you know, you're experienced, and you know what you're doing, and you're very practical. Oh, well, thank you. You know, I'll bet you help a lot of students. It, obviously, the ones you come into contact face-to-face, but uh, your website is available to everyone, correct? It is, yes. Um, schoolhabits.com, uh-huh. yep, and um, a YouTube channel by the same by the same name. And I'm finding, I'm getting some good feedback from students, but then educators as well who are using some of the tips in their classes, realizing that, kids need to know how to learn. It's not just that they need to learn. Yeah, so just out of curiosity, which gets more traffic, the website or the YouTube channel? Oh, we're getting into the analytics. (laughs) Um, Well, they're quantified differently. Um, I think think they're about about equal. Um, It seems to me that most of the YouTube videos are being viewed by um, students. I do have a lot of comments from teachers there. Um, but the majority of it is from students of all levels. So, I mean, I have down from fifth grade up to um, law school in there. And then um, the website feedback, I get a lot from teachers and then parents, too. Um, that's sort of another audience that I didn't really think would be attracted to what I had to say. Mm-hmm. But it's just, yeah, a byproduct, I suppose. Uh, but both of them. So It yeah. depends what type of learner you are. If yeah. you want to watch, yeah. if you're visual, then maybe check out the videos if you prefer to read, you know, it's about knowing yourself. And, yep, yep. Right? <laughs> well, you're, you're terrific, Katie, uh, and it's as, as, Acevedo? Acevedo. Acevedo, good. <laughs> I'm still working on it, too. Uh, Don't worry. <laughs> Katie <laughs> Acevedo, <my> <laughs> you're, you're, uh, you're a wonderful teacher and, well, uh, and um, I'm sure a wonderful mom, and uh, you have terrific information to offer. Schoolhabits.com and the YouTube channel, the same, Schoolhabits, youtube.com forward slash schoolhabits. Thank you so much for joining us on Distraction. You're, you're a very talented young woman. Well, thank you, Dr. Hallowell. It's very great to have you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
Please uh, go review our show uh, on Apple, the Apple Podcasts. Do you like what you're hearing on Distraction? Please rate us and review us on Apple Podcasts. It helps us grow the show. We really appreciate it. We, we need it. Just go to Apple Podcasts, write a review. Uh, we, we really depend on that. I know it takes a minute or two, but if you like the community we're growing with these Distraction Podcasts, please take that minute because uh, that's, that's the way we grow. There's you know a huge number of podcasts, and the only way we can distinguish ourselves is with your help, your reviews, uh, your taking a minute or two to do that. So if you do like these uh, podcasts, and I certainly hope you do, please go to the Apple Podcasts uh, and uh, write a review for us. We will be very grateful for your doing that. Distraction is produced by Collisions, the podcast division of CRN International. Collisions, podcast for curious people. This episode was produced by Sarah Gurton and Christina Torres, along with our audio engineers, Scott Person and Pat Keogh.